Hello to you. My name is Maria Konjelska and you are watching Poland Daily Culture. With me in the studio is Julia Wilde. Julia, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. And we are talking about poetry and especially we're talking about Herbert. Speaking of Herbert, one of the greatest poeter, poets of 20th century, especially the second part of 20th century. And even though he was not a Nobel Prize winner, he was exquisite and amazing. And I would like today actually to talk about one of the most favorite, my personally, poems, which is the Elegy of Fortin Brass. And as you, as a, a, as a PhD candidate for uh, English literature, you definitely know that Fortin Brass, like he is a, a character from, from Hamlet of Shakespeare. Yeah. And Fortin Brass is actually the person who, I would say, say two verses in the whole drama, because he comes at the very end, when everyone is dead, everyone is already lying on the floor, uh, and he just enters the thing and says, okay, if everyone dies and if Hamlet dies, I am the one who is entitled to take this throne. And he takes it. Yeah. And uh, so uh, Herbert, Herbert wrote a poem, Elegy of Fortune Brass, which was written to CM. And can you guess who CM was? Well, when we are talking about poet, poets, so, well, uh, probably it was uh, Czesław Miłosz. Yes, because of course, two poets, all of them were, they were in a huge battle. They were uh, work like, uh, of course, uh, I would say it was a, uh, all continuously fight between them and kind of competition. And it was it was written already in a moment when Czesław Miłosz immigrated to US and become more popular. And Herbert stayed in Poland, um, fighting also with poverty. And so that's why when we read this poem, we, we're reading the, it in two uh, dimensions. One dimension is like Fortune Brass talking to Hamlet, and the other dimension is Herbert talking to Miłosz. So listen to part of this. Now, when we are alone, we can talk prince, man to man, though you lie on the stairs and see no more than a dead end, nothing but black sand with broken rays. I could never think of your hands without smiling. And now that they lie on the stone like fallen nests, they are as defenseless as before. The end is exactly this. The hands lie apart, the sword lies apart, the head apart, and the knight's feet in soft slippers. You will have a soldier's funeral without having been a soldier. The only ritual I am acquainted with a little. There will be no candles, no singing, only cannon fuses and bursts. Crap dragged on the pavement, helmets, boots, artillery, horses, drums, drums. I know nothing exquisite. Those will be my maneuvers before I start to rule. One has to take the city by the neck and shake it a bit. So that's this Forte Brass, which I've checked that his name, because of course, I mean, um, Shakespeare didn't use like just any other, any name, but Fortune Brassman could mean Forte Braccio, so a man of a firm hand. Mm -hmm. And it is the moment when uh, basically Fortune Brass is up getting and Hamlet's already laying on the floor, dying, and then sort of, like they can talk eventually person to person. Yes, because before in the play, well, they hear that Fortin Brass has done this and that, right? He's present but only mentioned in the sense, and finally he arrives when everybody's, well, already dead or dying. Exactly. So they never ha actually have a proper conversation. And that's what uh, I would say uh, also Herbert is referring to, because he says, A dear prince, I have tasked to sewer project. In a degree on prostitutes and beggars, I must also elaborate a better system of prisons, since, as you justly said, Denmark is a prison. I go to my affairs. This night is born a star named Hamlet. We shall never meet. What I shall live will not be worth a tragedy. 
It is not for us to greet each other or bid farewell. We live on our hippelagos. And that water, the swords, what can they do? What can they do, Prince? And I do very strongly think that, they, I mean, even their whole poem is very much uh, Fortune Brass to Hamlet, that the two last verses are directly Herbert to Miwash. Oh, yeah, to, to the archipelagos, right? So Miwash uh, in US and Herbert here in Poland. Mm, it's like a different world completely. Yes, exactly. Yes. And yes. also he says the water, the words. And uh, also the question like, what kind of power words have? And uh, right now I would say we don't put so much power to words. So. Oh, I'm not sure if I would agree. I mean, those hateful words are extremely powerful. And uh, if we are talking about poetry, yes, I think it, it, it unfortunately has lost it, its power. But when we are talking about words in political discourse, let's say, or, um, or in the media, <laughs> for instance, it's very powerful. Uh, it's still very powerful and maybe even more than, than ever before. Might be, especially that you can, like everything stays there, so we remember what person said or oh, not yeah. said. Oh, yeah. But also he, they are, I mean, uh, Herbert is asking a question in this poem, what kind of, uh, what sense poetry has? And basically both of them, Miwot and Herbert, spend the whole of their lives on the creating literature and writing poetry. And her and Miwash found um, recognition. He was received by Nobel Prize. He later he became also a teacher at Berkeley. And Herbert was stuck here uh, with no, not much uh, financial uh, like circumstances and bigger. Uh, he wasn't rewarded financially for what he was doing. But and also not, I would say, living outside of. Uh, main metropolis somewhere in a small town just scribbling yeah yeah that's i think it's very moving because um i i think uh that it's there are, there are those small people uh, who are running the world in the sense that they, they make the everyday um, work right instead of great tragedies uh tragedies and um and uh, things that apparently matter, right? Uh, but if it, if it uh, wasn't for all those people who make, um, I don't know... Who go every day to work. Yes, who do go every day to work, who, who, who do all those man mundane things, let's say, right, that are described in the, in the poem, that our reality wouldn't simply work. And those people who are behaving as, as if they were um, destined for, for greater things, uh, wouldn't be able to do those greater things. So in a sense, everybody is necessary, everybody is needed. Right. Absolutely, and there's also the fact that Hamlet was a man of speech, yes? He was talking oh, yeah. mostly. He was a talker. <laughs> he was a talker. And Fortinbras was a man of action. He was, he was doing, he does, yeah. he say two words in the whole drama, yeah. but he does the most. He wins the battle with Poland, by the way. Oh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and he, um, he comes to Denmark with a huge army and takes over. And Hamlet was a person who talks the most in the play, and so all the time putting every situation in. And what he does, he, he just dies. <laughs> yes, because he's, he's impractical, terribly he's impractical. impractical. And that's what also here, uh, actually, Herbert is writing. Anyhow, you had to perish, Hamlet. You were not for life. You believed in crystal notions, not in human clay. Always twitching as if asleep, you hunted chimeras. Wolfishly, you crunched the air only to vomit. You knew no human thing. You did not even know how to breathe. Now you have peace, Hamlet. You accomplished what you had to, and you have peace. The rest is not silence, but belongs to me. You chose the easier part, an elegant thrust. But what is heroic death compared with eternal watching, with a cold apple in one's hand on a narrow chair, with a view of the end hill and the clock's dial? So this everyday work which you need to do, 
and which is left there for for others and not for yes. those. Not for, for those who die in a heroic manner, right? But and does, talk a lot. Yes, and talk a lot. So what that's, uh, but since both of them, in fact, use the words uh, so as well, Miwash and Herbert, and the word, because I mean, Her Herbert, after all, was not a doer, neither. He was, he was a poet. But that's a question, of course, uh, how much, uh, how poets influence us and what kind of, what they change in life and what, what, what they change in the world. And since we are recording already those episodes, we, I guess we both think that they actually change something in oh, the reality. Yes. Oh yes, they, they do, undoubtedly. Though it's, these are very subtle things, but they translate into something greater because it's uh, the human mentality and some uh, rules and the, the, the outlook on, on life. And also immortality. Because just to wrap up this episode, I would say that the poetry has, uh, I would say it's calling at least for immortality. Because we will perish, this episode will go into nothingness and probably the poems which we were reading today will outlast and live much longer. So thank you very much for being with us and watching Poland Daily Culture.